In this video, I'm going to go over the technique to solve quadratic inequalities. This technique is very important to use if you ever decide to take calculus. You use this technique all the time when you do the first derivative test and the second derivative test to figure out increase, decrease, a max, min, concavity, points of inflection, all that good stuff in calculus. So this is the basic technique that you'll use. Okay, so to solve quadratic inequalities, it's not as easy as a linear inequality where you can have an easy closed form solution. You can isolate x in one side and then the values on the other side. As simple as that. For quadratics, it's not as simple as that. You probably, if you're in pre-calcul, probably also deal with trig inequalities. So it's not as simple in that case either. So in so a diff, so you're gonna have to use a different technique basically, and the technique is. It's easy to compare things with zero because if things are greater than zero, it's positive in value. If it's less than zero, it's negative in value. Okay, so if you use zero as like the reference and you just check if things are positive or negative, then that's a good technique maybe. And that's what we're going to do actually for this quadratic inequality we have on screen here. And you also do this for trig ones as well. Okay. So we have this guy, 6x squared minus 11x is greater than 10. Okay. So you're comparing this parabola to this constant value, basically. So as I just said, it's easy to, it may be easier to compare it with zero. So let's move everything to one side. So subtract 10 on both sides. I get this right here. Okay. This guy, we can factor. So you would get 3x plus 2. 2x minus 5. I'm not going to go over how to factor. I didn't show my work clearly. You should know how to do this by now, hopefully. Um, so when you factor, you get this. And this side still stays the same. Okay? So when you compare it with 0, it might be a good idea to first find when it is 0. Okay? So how do we find when this guy is 0? Well, you can use that thing called the zero product property if you know the term. Um, or you can just kind of imagine it's the equal sign there. So what values of x would make this guy 0? Well, that's when x is negative 2 thirds. That would make this 0. 0 times who cares here is 0. Or x is 5 halves. When x is 5 halves, this guy would be 0. And then who cares what that is? 0 times who cares is 0. So to reiterate once more, whoops, when we compare with 0, it might be a good idea to first find when it is 0. Okay, and these are the two values that make this guy over here zero. Okay, so now let's draw a number line with these two zeros. So minus two thirds and five halves. Obviously, negative two thirds is smaller than five halves, so that's why it's on this side. Okay, so people struggle in the beginning to get their intervals, so that's why I would recommend to draw the number line first. Okay, and then you can get all your intervals. There's an interval over here. So all the way to negative infinity up to negative two thirds. We have one interval here, there. Okay, that will be some sign. And then up at minus two thirds, we just said it is zero. So something happens here, and then it's zero. Okay, and then after this zero, something happens again. It's positive or negative over here. So between this point and this point, this point is again zero, as we just found, right? So between this zero and this zero, it's going to be either positive or negative. So that's another interval. And then finally, we have this final interval after the zero at x is 5 halves onwards so 5 halves to infinity. That's another region. There are three intervals here. And we, again, the idea is, well, we know when it's zero. Okay, so now we're going to check before and after these zeros if it's positive or negative. And how do we do that? Well, we just pick test points. Okay, so here is the trick to doing this. A lot of teachers, for some reason, do not teach it like this, and I don't understand why. Okay. So you want to pick test points within each region. So for example, you just want to pick some point between negative infinity and negative two-thirds. So you can pick a point like, this is what, negative two-thirds is minus um, 0.67, something like that, right? So you can pick negative one, that's fine. You can pick negative 10, like I did, that's fine, that's also within this region. You can pick negative a thousand, you can pick negative a billion, you can pick negative ten billion, so on and so forth. Any points in this region. Usually you want to pick a 
nice number. So in this case, I picked x is negative 10, okay? So most teachers tell you to plug it into this line over here, and you figure out if it's positive or negative from here. I don't recommend doing that at all. It's very slow, because if you pick a nice number, then it's not too bad. Like even if I picked x is negative one, then you would have what, six plus 11 minus 10. Then you have to calculate 16 minus 10, which is six, that's positive. That's fine, not too bad. But if the, um, if the function here is more complicated, then you would have to do more tedious math. Or if the boundary point was more, um, not as small, it was like, I don't know, negative thousand, then you have to put, plug in like negative 1001, then the math gets a little more challenging, right? So you could plug it in from here, but as I just said, it could get very complicated. So I do not recommend plugging in from there. Instead, plug it in from this line. It's much easier if you plug it in from here, okay? Hopefully you agree that this factored form is the exact same as this expanded form. We just factored. It just looks different, but if you expand it back out, it's exactly the same values, okay? If you plug it in in the factored form, assuming, of course, that we can factor it in this, in the beginning, usually you can factor it, but when you plug it into factored form, you would just get some value times another value, maybe times another value if it gets more complicated, but you just count if there's how many negatives you have. If you have just one negative, then it will be a negative value because negative times a positive is negative. If you have two negatives, then two negatives make a positive. If you have zero negatives, then clearly it's positive, right? If you have three negatives, well, two negatives make a positive. You have one more negative, then you get a negative value at the end. Four negatives, you get a positive. So you just count how many positive and negatives there are. You don't care about what the value is. Here, as I said, you would have to calculate that six value of six. And it was not too bad, but again, the math can get complicated. Versus here, you just count how many positive values you have, or mainly you just care about the negative, how many negative values you have. If you have an even amount of negative values, then the final value is positive. If you have an odd amount of negative values, then that final value is negative. It's much easier if you do it like this. And you don't have to plug in like a very, very nice number. I like to go extreme, actually. You pick a huge negative number or a huge positive number to really see if it's positive or negative quickly. And that's the technique that I try to teach calculus students when they do the first derivative test, second derivative test. They take way too long trying to plug into here, trying to find the value, and then finally decide if it's positive or negative. Plug in from here, it's much faster. Okay, so with that said, if I chose my test point as x is negative 10, plug it into here, well, I would get negative 30 plus 2. That's clearly a negative value. I don't see, I don't, didn't even write the final value down. I don't care. I know it's negative right away. This one, same thing, negative 20 minus five, clearly that's a negative value. Two negatives make a positive, so that's greater than zero, okay? For here, this interval, we can't talk right now, picking at a test point, x is zero, you usually want to pick x is zero because it's easy. Um, when x is zero, when it's a polynomial, you can plug in here, it's clearly negative, right? Zero minus zero minus 10, but you can also plug into here, as I said, it'll be positive times a negative. 2 times a negative 5, positive times a negative. That's clearly negative. There's an odd number of negative values, so it's negative. We go to the final interval. We can plug in. So this is where I go kind of extreme. x is 100, for example. Usually, if the people go from here, people plug like x is 3, and then you have to go calculate the value, as I said. right? Again, not too bad, but you can see already, even when x is 3, it gets a little more complicated. It'll be 6 times 9 minus 33 minus 10. Again, not that bad, but you can see how you have to compute it, right? I'm a little repetitive now, I'm a broken record. But now if I plug in x is 100 into here, it makes the math very easy. 300 plus 2, that's clearly positive. 302, 200 minus 5, that's clearly positive. 195, again, I don't care about the values, but I can clearly see it's positive right there. So I know it's a positive value. See how much faster that was? Okay, hopefully I convinced you here to do it, to plug in from the factored form. Obviously, if your problem was factorable, then you can do it easily. Okay, so what was the whole point of doing this? Well, we're trying to find when this guy is bigger than zero. We found when it's zero, and we're now look, we now looked around it. So this 
and this are when it's greater than zero. That was the question. Okay? So, let's draw on the number line. Sometimes you have to do this when you first learn it. So, the inequality sign does not have the equal, so we have an open circle on both the zeros. Okay? This region satisfies the inequality because it's greater than zero, so we're going to draw an arrow this way. Everything before negative two-thirds is a valid value of x. And over here as well, everything after five halves is a valid value of x, not including. So I didn't fill it in in the next problem. You'll see that I'll fill it in. Okay? So that's how we would graph it on a number line. Now, how do we write it in um, as a solution, though? So you would have to define your values of x. So you can say x is less than negative two-thirds or x is greater than five halves. Why do we have this or here? Well, you can see they're kind of, um, you can't have both of them happen at the same time. You can, if this is the value, then it satisfies the condition x is less than negative two-thirds, right? It can't satisfy this condition x is greater than five halves. Impossible. So that's why I put the or. If it satisfies either one of them, then it's fine. That's the or. In the next example, it'll be an and, so I'll explain that when that happens, but that's why I put the or. If either condition is true, then the whole thing's true. Okay? This is a basic of programming as well, if you get into programming. So you can write it like this, but you probably, your teacher probably wants interval notation. So we write the intervals down, we exactly did over here. From negative infinity to negative two-thirds, we have the parentheses. First of all, for infinity, you always put parentheses. You don't put the square bracket. And here we put the parentheses because we don't have the equal sign under with the inequality. Instead of or, we put this u, which stands for union, and then we put the next interval, five halves to infinity. Okay? So that was this first one. Now let me quickly go over the second example. And that hopefully you get the concept down. So I'll go faster on this one. So we have 4x squared is less than or equal to 19x minus 12. Remember the idea for solving quadratic inequalities is you want to compare it with zero. So we move everything to one side. So I move these two to the left. That's this line. And then I factored. Okay. So I know it's zero when x is 4 and when x is 3 fourths. Okay. So I drew my number line with my two zeros. Okay, and then I picked my intervals out. Here's one interval, minus infinity to three-fourths. Here's another interval, three-fourths to four. And then the last one, four to infinity. That's these three over here. Okay, plug in test points here. We want to plug in x is zero probably. So if I plug in from here, it's 12, which is positive. Or again, if I plug in from here, it'll be negative times positive. Sorry, negative times negative. Two negatives make a positive. See, that's why this, again, you just count how many negatives you have. If you have an even number, then it's positive. Between 3 fourths and 4th, I can plug in x is 1, for example. This one would be positive, 4 minus 3. This one would be negative, 1 minus 4. So that's clearly negative. There's an odd number of negative numbers, right? So that's negative. And here, I plugged in x is 10, so most people probably plug in 5, and then you have to go calculate. See, 19 times 5. Again, it's not that bad, but you're going to have to calculate that. And then 25 times 4. That's 100. Again, that's not that bad, but you can see how math can get complicated and tedious. And it's um, high, you might make an error. Versus, if I plug in like an uh, extreme number, this isn't that extreme, but remember I said you can plug in like x is a billion, for example. You plug in here, a billion times 4 minus 3, that's clearly positive. A billion minus 4, that's clearly positive as well. Here I plugged in x is 10 to just show that 40 minus 3 times um, 10 minus 4, that's positive as well. Okay, so I found if it's positive or negative in all the intervals. Now, let's answer the original question. We're interested in when it's less than or equal to zero. Well, we found when it's zero, that's these two points. So we would have a shaded circle, a closed circle, instead of the open one, like in this problem here. It was open because there's no equal sign in the inequality. But now there is, so it's going to be a shaded circle. Okay, the, we were interested in less than or equal to zero. Only this one is less than zero, right? So it's this interval, so we're going to shade in between the two 
dots, like that. Okay, now how do we write our solution in terms of x, not on a number line? Well, x is greater than or equal to 3 fourths, clearly, right? Even on the number line. Here we put and x is less than or equal to 4. Why do we put and? And signif sig signals that, signifies, signals, that signifies the word? I feel like it is. Anyway, um, that both conditions need to be true at the same time. So if I pick, for example, x is 5, that's clearly out of our, the region we just drew, right? But it's satisfying x is greater than 3 fourths, greater than or equal to 3 fourths, right? But it's not satisfying this one, clearly. That's why I put the and. It has to satisfy both conditions. Versus in this one, remember, if it satisfies either one, then it's fine. And it has to satisfy both. Again, this is a basic programming thing that you need to learn if you ever get into programming. Okay. So you can write it like this, or you could just write it as one big inequality. You could just combine the two, 3 fourths less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 4. Or but even better, the easiest way in my opinion is to write it in interval notation. So we use the square brackets because there's the equal sign now. Square bracket 3 fourth, comma, 4, close the square bracket. Okay? And that's it for this video. Hopefully, once again, this has helped to help understand why we do this procedure. Again, to recap, we're comparing it with zero because for quadratics, it's not easy to get a closed form solution like we can for linear inequalities. We compare it with zero. We find when it's zero first, like we did in this one as well. And then we choose test points in each of the intervals. After, well, we first have to define the intervals and then we choose test points. Okay, that's the idea. Please like and subscribe as always if you found this helpful.